Welcome back, everybody, to part three of my reaction to Extra History's Simon Bolivar series. I hope you're enjoying it as much as I have. Uh, as I said at the very beginning of episode one, which uh, you can see in the description below, the link to the first episode of my reaction, as well as the link to the original video for part three. As I said, I don't know a lot about Simon Bolivar, so I'm learning. And this is a very different reaction than most of my reactions where I don't really have a lot to add other than some general observations and whether when they talk about other parts of history. So it uh, seems that you're enjoying that and I'll probably do more of it in the future. Uh, I do like to add little bits here and there what I can. And I thought it was interesting. You know, some people make the um, the parallel between Simon Bolivar and George Washington. Now, there are some very clear similarities as well as some very distinct differences. Uh, so I, I don't know enough about Simon Bolivar to make that comparison myself, but obviously both being known as fathers of nations. Uh, it's interesting that in both cases, neither one of them had biological children of their own. And in both cases, experts seem to agree that it was from some uh, illness from when they were younger that caused them not to be able to have children. So I thought that was an interesting uh, dynamic that was happening between the two uh, of these men who do show some similarities in terms of what they were able to bring to history. So I'm ready to dive into part three. I would have done it earlier in the day, but uh, my wife and I spent most of the morning watching the uh, the funeral of uh, Prince Philip, Duke of Edinburgh. Uh, and as someone who's very fond of the royal family in Britain and uh, has always been fascinated by their history, um, I've certainly had the royal family, especially uh, Her Majesty the Queen, in my thoughts. Um, so um, I'm sure many of you watch that as well. Uh, all right, let's go ahead and dive into this today. Maria y San Jose pulled away from the shores of Venezuela. One man stood on deck, looking back. He was a grimmer man, a harder man than the youth full of verve who, a handful of years earlier, had stumbled onto the shores of London. His wealth was gone, his power was gone, but his dreams were yet his. He vowed to return to those shores, and then turned away. His defeat has given him a new vision, a new idea of what liberation must look like. He no longer thinks of Venezuela alone, he now thinks of all of Latin America. He realizes that no one nation is enough to fight off the might of Spain, even declining and corrupt as it is. Liberty would have to come to all nations, or none. Hmm. He has become pragmatic. If this was gonna work, Latin America couldn't just be a loose federation as the fledgling United States had become after its revolution. They would need to be a strong, centralized power. So we talked about this yesterday with yesterday's episode about how uh, he was very fired up and kind of a, a go-getter and wanted to make things happen. And we talked about how a lot of times when people do that, they need a stabilizing influence or they need something to happen that causes them to be a little more pragmatic about the situation. Uh, you know, Alexander Hamilton comes to mind in American history, who was a guy very much like this, a young guy who's fired up, who just wants to get things done, but needed a stabilizing influence like George Washington to come alongside him and temper those expectations and those energies uh, into what was realistic. So I wonder, um, I wondered how much this defeat that he has suffered and what we talked about yesterday would influence his view. And I thought it would have caused him to step back and think smaller, but it actually seems to have made him think even bigger. This isn't just about Venezuela. This is about Venezuela and Colombia and the other nations that surround them and, and how we can break all of them away from Spain at one time. They would need strong leadership, with an executive who could act swiftly and decisively to pull the people together and deflect any Spanish threat. But before he could act on any of this, he had to get himself back into the action. He was stuck in Curacao, a small island held by the British off the coast of Venezuela, and he was penniless. The Spanish had confiscated all of his property, his mines, his lands, his slaves, all gone. He had bought his way into this revolution. So again, interesting dynamic to think about. And we said the same thing about George Washington and others. Uh, obviously, different world. I'm not trying to say that it's easy to pass judgment on people from 200 years ago. But uh, it is an interesting thing to look at these people who were leaders of fighting for freedom while systematically denying that freedom to other people owning slaves while talking about declaring freedom from a mother country. Just interesting to look back and think about. How was he to continue without those funds? 
He was able to borrow a small amount from a merchant, just enough to hire a boat and equip a small band of men to sail for New Granada, where he had heard the revolution was still alive. And the revolution he found there was indeed alive, but it was fractured. Different groups vying mm. for power in different regions. The whole country splintered. He had work to do. He rapidly won the admiration of their nominal president, and he and his band were commissioned to fight in the New Granada Rebellion. The local commanders, however, were none too eager to see this foreign revolutionary, one who had just handed his former commander to the Spanish. They sent him off to garrison a small town, but this time he would do more than merely dream of glory. He wrote, spreading his ideas to the world. He socialized, gaining the support of the local mm. elite, and he walked among the people, gaining the support of the poor, the indigent, the downtrodden. And this is really important for a guy who was born into wealth and was kind of always at a different social level. Though granted, being born in uh, South America, he wasn't quite at the level of uh, being a native-born Spanish person, but... Um, Getting to know the people at the ground level, that's important. He's building uh, kind of a grassroots effort, and this is going to get him on the good side of everybody. And, and I can see how this could, could l propel him uh, in a way that he hadn't been able to do previously. His small band of 70 quickly grew to 200. Then he saw an opportunity. A group of royalists had occupied a position on a nearby river, cutting off revolutionary forces. He wrote to command to ask permission to dislodge them. His request was denied. He went anyway. Hmm. His men built small boats and they paddled up the river. He sent one man ahead to offer the enemy garrison commander, a garrison which numbered 500 by the way, an opportunity to surrender. The man just laughed and turned this envoy away. Then Bolivar's men came around the bend and leapt out of their boats, guns blazing. The garrison scattered in terror, leaving behind a large cache of weapons and munitions. Nice. Bolivar turned to the people of the occupied town and exhorted them to join his cause. And again, his ranks grew. Over the next 15 days, he waged a lightning campaign. His men were like phantoms. They moved faster than anybody expected, and they always approached from ways thought impassable. Thick jungle, pestilential swamps. Each time they struck, a new town fell. And with each town, his small force grew more towards becoming an army. Wow. At the end of those 15 days, he had liberated 500 kilometers of vital riverway. Holy and cow. changed the course of the Granadan fight for independence. But his conquests had taken him right to the border of Venezuela. And his mind, again, began to turn to liberating his homeland. After a couple more brilliant victories and the final assurance of liberty for Granada, he began to march towards his suffering nation. So it's amazing that he's at the very lowest of uh, places and he gets kind of given this backwater garrison duty with 70 people and he turns that into a revolution that wins independence. That's, that's a pretty incredible story and that says a lot about the personal charisma that this man must have had, that he was able to get people to follow him. And, you know, there are certain people in history that they say that about. Like George Washington was one of those people that, um, you know, people said he was always the tallest guy in the room and he was always very, you know, he's kind of soft spoken, but um, always commanded the, the center of attention in whatever room he was in. And there are people like that who, if they know how to harness that ability, uh, can be incredible leaders because all leadership really is is influence. I tell students this all the time. A lot of students think that they're not leaders because they're not put in charge of something or they don't have an elected position. As we all know, there are plenty of people who have elected positions that are really not leaders. Uh, leadership is influence. And if you use your influence to better the people around you, they will follow you. That's what leadership really is. For in Venezuela, the reprisals of the Spanish had been swift and brutal. Bolivar may have had the connections to escape, but most weren't so lucky. Mass executions, rapine, and plunder were rampant. Not even children were spared. But most of the Granadans didn't want to fight to liberate another country. So with only 500 ill, undersupplied, and undertrained troops, Bolivar crossed once again into his homeland. So I would think, I don't know what happens, but I would think he'd basically follow the same strategy, right? Take your 500 men, liberate a town, get the people to rise up, and repeat until you get thousands. I don't know if that's what happens or not. Through guile, surprise, and fear, he rapidly won another string of victories, swelling his ranks once again. But Bolivar's earlier losses had changed him. 
He was a sterner man, a grimmer man, and he would meet the Spanish atrocity for atrocity. Mm. Soon after entering Venezuela, he declared, Our vengeance shall rival Spanish ferocity. Our goodwill is at last exhausted, and since our oppressors compel us to mortal warfare, they shall disappear from America, and mm. our land shall be purged of the monsters that infest Interesting. it. Our hate shall be inexorable, and our war shall be to the death. And he decreed a death sentence for all Spaniards who did not turn against Spain. It galvanized galvanized the revolutionaries, and drove Republicans to his cause, but it also laid the groundwork for a legacy of blood. Still, his lightning campaign dashed Spanish resistance at Merida, Trujillo, Barquisimeto, and Valencia, and soon, less than a year after he had slipped off in disgrace, he was returning to Caracas, the conquering hero. He was celebrated in the streets. He had liberated Venezuela. But the work was not yet done. The Spanish still had a holdout a hundred miles away, slave uprisings had broken out against the white-led rebellion, and, as would prove mm. worst of all, the Legion of Hell had declared for the Spanish cause. Well then, the Legion of Hell. Also, again, let's talk about this. The slaves, right? They see these people fighting for their independence, and they're thinking, okay, why don't we fight for our freedom too? And this had happened, I think, in Haiti there had been a slave uprising that had actually taken over the country. Uh, so, yeah, but interesting. You're fighting for your independence while you're putting down a rebellion from slaves who are doing the same thing. And their name barely does them justice. They were the brutal horsemen of the plains, owing no loyalty to anyone, living in the saddle like Mongols, and holding life, both their own and those they faced, cheap. They were a nightmare that stalked Venezuela. Armed with fire-hardened spears rather than any modern weaponry, they would show up at a town, run down the men as they fled, rape the women, and play cruel wow. games where they would impale the children on their lances, leaving Ugh. the infants there as a gruesome totem for when they rode into battle. What? And they neither gave nor expected quarter. When they would fight the Republican troops, they would throw themselves at them in mounted waves, overwhelming their firearms with sheer mass and ferocity. And when they won, not a man was spared. And so now, Bolivar's proclamation that this would be a war to the death had truly come to be. But instead of it being a war to the death with the Spanish, it was a war to the death with his own people, becoming mm. a civil war spilling out on racial lines. Because his troops too slaughtered their prisoners, and murdered any of the Legion of Hell that would fall into their hands, often dismembering them and leaving Jeez. pieces on spikes for all to see. In the midst of all this, any pretense to republicanism disappeared, as Bolivar centralized all power in himself. Meanwhile, atrocities continued to mount. So, again, interesting dynamic here. A guy fighting for the freedom of his people, but taking all the power for himself. So, definitely very different than George Washington in that way, who uh, George Washington willingly gave up power willingly passed over the opportunity to be he probably if he had wanted it could have been the king of america um so interesting spaniards wore the ears of the dead as trophies the legion left whole villages with nothing but ghosts and he himself ordered a thousand prisoners not even pow's decapitated one by one and with each passing day his hold was slipping Every victory in the field was offset by the fact that the Legion and the slave uprisings could recruit men far faster than he could, as the vast mixed race and black population saw an opportunity to attack those who had oppressed them. The economy was in tatters, and couldn't supply his army or even build new guns, and every victory came at a cost in irreplaceable men. Soon he was putting twelve-year-olds under arms. Venezuela was awash in blood, and attrition and time took their toll. On June 15, 1814, waves of horsemen crashed through Republican lines at La Puerta, a critical pass. So it's interesting to think about when this is going on, because this is uh, summer of 1814. This is uh, kind of the height of the War of 1812 in North America. This is also uh, right near the end of the Napoleonic Wars in Europe. There is a lot going on all across the world right now. Uh, and then this is happening in South America. That's a lot happening in, in just a couple of years' time. A month later, they were in Caracas. Panic filled the streets. People fled, run down by horsemen as they tried to get away. Bolivar escaped and rallied his troops to one more time put up a desperate last stand. But by now, the forces he'd been using to bottle up the Spanish had been siphoned off, and the Spanish royalists' forces had been able to re-coalesce. 
In the final battle, heavily outnumbered, Bolivar's Republicans sold themselves dearly, but it would not be enough. And so, the Second Republic collapsed. Not from the might of the Spanish, but from the weight of its own internal divisions. And for the second time, Bolivar found himself on a boat, sailing to New Granada, looking back at a republic that might have been. Hmm. Interesting. So, uh, in the first two episodes, I found myself really admiring this guy. I'm kind of taking a step back from that now, because obviously, uh, there's no side in what's happening right now that's clean. I mean, they, they've all... Uh, got their fair share of ugliness in what they're doing. And I'll be curious to to dig into this a little more when the whole series is over and to read more about what was going on and what compelled him to these brutalities uh, so I can understand it a little better. And maybe some of you can offer some uh, some observations on that, some of you who know more about the man and these events than I do. Uh, but obviously not particularly... Um, admirable the way this has been handled by any side in this war right now so i'll be curious to see where it goes tomorrow let me know your thoughts use the comment section below please hit that like button if you would and make sure you check out the original content thanks for watching